This episode is brought to you in part by Pittsburgh Seminary's Henderson Leadership Conference, September 22nd to 24th with Dr. Diana Butler-Bass. Attend in person or online for lectures and workshops with strategies for ministry amid political and theological divisions. Visit www.pts.edu slash Henderson. This episode is brought to you by Our Daily Bread Ministries, a global media organization that makes the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to all. Visit whereyou'refrom.org for more information. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Starin, the host of the Truce Podcast. And this week, I thought we'd do something a little bit different. I was recently the guest on the Spiritual Life and Leadership Podcast hosted by Marcus Watson. And I thought I would replay that interview for you because it gives a really nice overview of where Truce is going throughout this season. That, and I also really needed a few weeks off. I've been working almost continually on this series for a year, so I thought I'd take a couple weeks off. But in the meantime, you get to enjoy this episode from Spiritual Life and Leadership. I hope you enjoy. Hey, I want to ask you a question. Do you recognize these lines from uh, songs? The first one is this, God bless America, land that I love. That's number one. Here's number two. America the beautiful, God shed his grace on thee. And then here's line number three, although it's not actually from a song. Line is simply this, one nation under God. Uh, Now, if you're an American, I'm sure you recognize all three of these. Uh, If you're listening in another part of the world, let me fill you in. The first two of these lines are from well-loved American patriotic songs. The third one is a line from the American Pledge of Allegiance, a pledge which is recited by American school children from the moment they start kindergarten all the way until their last day of high school. Now, the United States has had a long and complicated relationship with God. And what's really fascinating is the fact that communist Russia played a significant role in the way that many Americans think about that relationship with God today. A lot of people think about the United States as a Christian nation, both people in the United States and people around the world. The question is, is it? And what does it mean to be a Christian nation? And what does the Soviet Union have to do with any of this? And also, as spiritual leaders, what is a proper relationship between one's nation, any nation, and the people of God, the church? Uh, This is a really fascinating conversation, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Uh, Before we get into it, let me just mention one thing. I just want to say how grateful I am, and here, let me just mention my book, (laughs) how grateful I am that my book, Beyond Thingification, Helping Your Church Engage in God's Mission, became an Amazon number one bestseller this week. Do-do-do-do! I'm so excited. (laughs) Uh, If you were one of the many folks who bought a copy, uh, I just want to say thank you to you. Uh, I I hope it's a wonderful blessing to you. Uh, If you haven't yet picked up a copy, uh, I encourage you to do so. It'll help you get off the hamster wheel of just kind of doing the same old, same old ministry that just doesn't seem to work anymore uh, in a a new world, in a new culture, in a new uh, society. Uh, And instead, uh, this book will give you a process for discovering what God is already doing in your community and a way to discern how to join God in what God is already doing. And so if you want to know more about the book, uh, you can go to www.marcuswatson.com slash book. Again, Marcus with a K. Uh, and then there are links to um, uh, buy the book from, uh, from that webpage. Anyway, I am excited to share with you this really fascinating conversation uh, with Chris Starin, host of the Truce Podcast. I'm Marcus Watson, and this is Episode 71 of Spiritual Life and Leadership. Hey everyone, uh, I am here with Chris Starin, uh, the host of the Truce Podcast, uh, which is a history podcast that looks inside the Christian church. Hi Chris, how you doing? Hey, I'm great, Marcus. How are you? 
I'm doing great. Um, why don't you uh, just real quick tell us kind of what you do, and uh, then we'll get into the co- podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I again, I'm Chris, and I'm the host of the Truce Podcast, and it it is a show that looks deep inside the Christian Church. Uh, we try to see um, how we got here and how we can do better. Uh, and so that involves a lot of history, reenactments, sound effects, music, a lot of wacky stuff. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I'm also the uh, writer, director, producer of Bringing Up Bobby, which is a Christian film, mm. and Between the Walls. Uh, they're on Pure Flix right now, and we're working oh, cool. towards getting them on places like Hoopla. Uh, mm. If you've got, you can get it through your library hopefully soon. And huh. uh, I'm the author of Cradle Robber, which uh, is a is a, a Christian novel that is about okay. something that it does not sound like it's about. Um, hmm. But I don't want to give it away. Oh, <laughs> so it's not actually about cradle robbing. <laughs> it is not about Marianne. cradle robbing. No, uh, <laughs> okay. It, yeah, it is a yeah. Okay. It is yeah. It's a it's a, a Christian book um, that kind of helps people deal with anger. Uh, okay. But in a fiction fictional story. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And you've been doing uh, the Truce podcast for how long again? I've been releasing episodes for two years. Two years. Okay, yeah. cool. And I, I'll just say it's a really well done podcast. Thank you. Um, it's um, lots of research, lots of interviews, and um, uh, you know, just kind of very uh, well, yeah, well produced and and ex- well executed, and just really interesting. So um, I never come to the end of a truce podcast and think. Well, I could have done something else with those 30 minutes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes I <laughs> think you. that with yeah. some podcasts. Yeah. yeah. But I never think that at the end of one of your episodes. So that's yeah. great. Good. Um, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me uh, just ask you a couple of get to know you questions real quick. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, Chris, when do you feel truly alive? Yeah. I. I tr- this is going to... St- we're going to start off with my inner nerd right away. I, I love <laughs> being at historic sites. Uh, so mm. I, I love, especially touring around Europe. Um, and I, I really, nice. really like to hike. And so if I get to a mountain pass, I am, that's the happiest I'm going to be. Mm. Um, I, I'm not a huge mountain peak guy, but I love mountain passes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh what's the difference? <laughs> Someone who's not familiar with mountains, maybe in that. Yeah. Way, well, like a pass is usually like that gap between two mountains, uh, or oh. the saddle. And, uh, you usually like transitioning from one valley to the other. So it's like, okay. oftentimes you're getting a grand view. You like pop over this thing, get an awesome view, but you yeah. don't usually have the risk of being on a mountain where you have to like have ropes and yeah. yeah. Okay. So I live in oh. Western Wyoming and there's okay. a lot of hiking out here. Um, uh, that's so cool. I, yeah, I've, I've, I've had a lot more fun on passes than yeah. like trying to stay on top of a mountain and not die. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, second question. If your life was a book, what would its title be? Yeah. I think it would be called he's overthinking this, uh, hmm. because I, I, uh, tend to lay awake at night and think about things that I have no business thinking about. Um, hmm. so that would be like, how could we solve, uh, uh, educational issues in this country. You know, I, okay. I, I drive a school bus as one of my jobs, but I am not like a teacher. Why uh-huh. am I thinking about this? You know, or, uh. Uh, you know, <laughs> how could we stop ocean plastic? You know, and like oh, I, I yeah. will lie awake thinking about stuff. I have, I have no, wow. no power over. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, uh, that sounds like it probably is a good quality in terms of <laughs> It helps with the show. Providing content for the show. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> yeah. Thinking. It really That's does. That's great. That's great. All right. And then the last question, um, uh, what would the t- uh, title of the current chapter of your life be? Yeah, I think it would be called the Be Still. Because uh, mm. that's uh, one of our, my brother and I, uh, one of our favorite verses is that be still and know that I am God. Yeah. Um, because we're both doers. And right now I'm in a bit of a holding pattern in life. And yeah. uh, that is one of those verses that keeps coming up is be still, know that I am nice. God. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, good. That's great. Well, um, why don't you give us uh, just for a few minutes, uh, just kind of tell us your story, uh, what brought you to where you are today, and even to kind of what led you to do the podcast that you're doing now. Sure. Yeah. Well, I um, I have two really great and supportive parents who are awesome. Mm-hmm. So if they're hearing this, I love you guys. Hope you're doing well. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, they 
encouraged my brother and I, and we're twins, so I end up referring to myself in the plural a lot, so forgive me. But uh, mm-hmm. they encouraged us to, you know, have fun, build forts, uh, use the video camera to make videos. Mm-hmm. So my brother and I made a bunch of videos, 40 videos, our senior year of high school. And that uh, led us to want to go to film school. And in film school, mm-hmm. it's like I was being torn between being a pastor and making movies. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. you know, I could do both. Uh. <laughs> I uh. could, I can make f- films for the Lord. And mm-hmm. uh, this was back when, you know, people still watched DVDs and stuff. Yeah. And I had never seen a Christian film at that point. So my brother and I started making them before we'd ever seen one, hmm. and, which was great fun for us. We didn't know all the tropes and rules and stuff. So, um, and, and then uh, after the, the film thing, fizzled out. It was just a lot of stress. We couldn't make money at it. Um, We had tried making a podcast. This was Mm. like 12 years ago before anybody knew what a podcast was. Uh, We tried making a show to advertise for the movies. And then the show became the part that I liked more than making the movies. (laughs) <laughs> mm, wow! Yeah, and and so I had been thinking for a long time. Boy, I would really like to get back into that because yeah. you can uh, you can tell stories, you can be very creative with audio without having all the pitfalls of visual stuff, like having to get right. clearances and copyright stuff. It's uh, it's not it's uh-huh. much harder to deal with uh, with video. Yeah. And, uh, and so this has been just a great way for me to, to get back involved with that. And a lot of my friends, uh, I have a lot of friends of kind of all over the place, politically all over the place, religiously. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this, especially after the 2016 election, there was a lot of anger, a lot of yeah. animosity, um, and a lot of questioning God. And I'm talking on all sides of this. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and so this show, I kind of started out thinking, well, how can I kind of address these issues and then also Mm -hmm. deal with my own questions uh, and which frequently these episodes are, it's like me struggling with my own things, those things that keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the show has been a great, almost therapeutic way to address those concerns that, that me and my friends have had, you know, why, why, Why is this thing happening? Um, I find that if I can understand how we got to a place, it's much Mm -hmm. easier for me to deal with reality Um, rather than be like this, this moment is completely unprecedented, uh, which is like the most overused word of this year. I think 2020, it, it, that should be (laughs) deemed the most overused word Yeah, Um, Yeah. because a lot of what we're going through as president, but anyway, so yeah. Here I am now on podcast. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. So um, I, I want to talk with you because of the topic that you've been doing recently. Why don't you just kind of tell us about the this topic? Just kind of give us a summary of what you've been talking about. Yeah. Well, so we're spending a year talking about how the rise of communism in Russia impacted the American Christian church. Which sounds like a real snooze fest, uh, but it mm-hmm. is a lot of fun and very interesting. You see it all the time. Even uh, if you follow like the Babylon Bee on Instagram, uh-huh. uh, you will see that they are constantly referencing communism and socialism, mm-hmm. uh, which is something that we have been doing, um, it's kind of scapegoating uh, mm-hmm. for a long time in the United States. And yeah. uh, and so we are we are very much still in this conversation today. Um, so yeah, that's that's the yeah. goal is to figure out how how did the rise of communism impact the American Christian church. And so can you give us a little summary of uh, yeah. how that happened? Yeah. yeah. I, I'll take uh, two minutes to, to explain what I'm taking a year to do on my show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah. So essentially it all s- started with labor issues because uh, mm. in the you know 1800s you have the rise of the industrial revolution and uh-huh. people are moving from the countryside to the city where there are jobs and okay. and they're looking for this stuff but uh, there's there are no labor laws in Russia or in the United States there's okay. nothing and are, and are you talking about in both countries or all yeah. over the world this is happening yeah all over the all over okay. the industrialized world but uh, we're you know focusing on those two countries. And so this is where the United States and Russia are kind of running parallel to each other. Um, Mm. There, there aren't the labor laws that we expect today where you go to a workplace and you expect 
a safe work environment. You expect mm. there aren't going to be little children there, um, those kinds of things. And um, so Tsar Nicholas II uh, comes into power and uh, he is such an interesting character, uh, mm. but uh, he, like a lot of royals, is kind of kept out of interacting with the common people because um, they, they believe that they are chosen by God. And I think you can find biblical backing for that, that God puts leaders into place. Um, mm -hmm. But therefore, you can take this dark turn and say that whatever they want is God's will. Mm. Right. Um, mm. So, <laughs> so Tsar Nicholas II um, gets involved with a guy named Rasputin you may have heard about. We've got a whole episode about him. Uh, mm -hmm. They get tied up in mysticism and um, – uh, through a really dark series of events, they, uh, when their people come to them and they say, listen, we've got these labor issues and, and you guys need to solve this. The czars need to solve this. Uh, the czars, uh, men open fire on them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and instead of listening to the people and yeah. adjusting, they oppress them. Uh, mm -hmm. because they're like, well, how dare you? We're, we're God's favorite people. Of course you're going right. to obey us. Uh, at, at about the same time, the United States is going through those things. They're, they're, we're, we're going through all these um, turmoils where there are children working in factories, like literally like hundreds of thousands of kids working mm -hmm. in factories in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and we are also seeing, like they were seeing in Russia, you're seeing communists and socialists uh, meeting and talking and forming groups. You're seeing anarchists and you're seeing capitalists. Um, and mm. so there are all these different movements kind of going together. And there's this, this kind of struggle of like, who's going to rise to the top. And of course yeah. in Russia, when the, the Russian revolution uh, takes off um, it's them revolting against Tsar Nicholas and um, and they're they're going to try to put their own government into place, but it it doesn't work. Um, and it opens the door for uh, Vladimir Lenin and his guys to come in and establish communism, um, mm. which was incredibly oppressive. Um, mm. And I think you know, even now, as I'm doing research for sort of the end of the series, I'm, I'm still reading stuff where people put "godless communism" in air quotes, mm. and uh, the reality is that. According to Karl Marx, communism was to be inherently atheistic mm. uh, because uh, there is that that idea that you probably sound familiar to your listeners that um, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. Yeah, that concept, which really what he was trying to say uh, is that we religion was in his mind invented as a way to dull the pain of life. But mm. if we took away the pain of life and provided for people's needs, they would no longer uh, need religion. Um, so it, it was less of a slam against religion and more of him saying, uh, we need to take care of the pain in people's lives. Interesting. Um, Which is, um, so it, what's interesting is it was intended to be a good thing. Right. Yeah. To relieve people of their pain. Yeah. Uh, coming from the perspective, interesting. I, I didn't know this. Right. That um, well, if you relieve people of their pain, then they don't need God anymore. Right? right. Because God, the 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 purpose, so to speak, of God in His mind, I guess Marx's right. mind was to relieve people of their pain. But we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Any, anyway, interesting. Fascinating. Take care of their okay. needs. It is. Yeah. yeah it's fascinating. Um, of course, you know. Uh, we we know that's not true, <laughs> but that that was his philosophy. Um, sure. And unfortunately, um, the way it was put into practice in uh, the time of Lenin and Stalin and even Mao, uh, it became a very murderous way, uh, an economic model, and yeah. uh, they just flat out killed millions of people. And and so. I try in one of the episodes to kind of quantify it, but we as humans mm. were bad at numbers, especially mm -hmm. giant numbers, you know? Yeah. Um, so you look at a guy like Adolf Hitler. Uh, we, we have a very, he's sort of the, the bad guy that we know the most about in the American yeah. education system. Well, yeah. we, he killed 6 million Jews in concentration camps 
and another five million who weren't Jews. Uh, we don't have like we don't pay attention to them at all in the, in the interesting secular world or in the in the American world. We don't yeah. we don't pay attention. But that was three million Christians. Um, two million mm. um, of the the other two million were a mixture of homosexuals, um, disabled mm. people, and anybody that they deemed undesirable, um, like yeah. gypsies. Um, so yeah. Hitler kills eleven million people in his concentration camps, whereas. Uh, Stalin um, had something like uh, uh, it's between 20 and 25 million people killed yeah, of yeah, his wow. own people. Um, wow. uh, obviously because of both of them, a lot of other people died at war. Um, but the other guy we don't pay any attention to is Mao who killed 44 million of his own people. Also Holy a communist. Um, so if you do the math, the communists really, <sighs> I don't want to say they win that game because it's a really bad game yeah. to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But they, their numbers are the biggest numbers. Yeah. Um, and right. so wow. when you then come to the United States um, and you hear people who are afraid of godless communism, mm -hmm. there is a reason for that. Um, right. And, and we don't often like to say that. It doesn't sound, you know, academic or wise of us, but there, they, they are the people who are the most responsible for the death of humans in the mm -hmm. history of the world. Um, wow. Just those two communist nations. Now, you can also say, like, I don't want to get too far off track, but Genghis Khan may have killed a tremendous amount of people, but because it was so long ago, we don't know how many. Right. Um, right. But he, he killed, um, I think one estimate I saw was like 11% of the world. Holy um, cow. At the time, it, it, like an insane amount of people. Um, Holy cow. But we don't know how many people yeah. um, because they didn't have as accurate records. Yeah. But um, anyway, so coming into the United States, uh, we, instead of going communist and socialist, we would decide that we're going to, uh, well, uh, we, we get a jumble of things. Uh, you get the mm -hmm. labor movement um, and you get... Um, organized labor that rises up in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And because of the New Deal, that becomes a uh, legalized thing that uh, you mm. can't, you are now legally allowed to be a part of a union um, mm. and you can't be oppressed for that. Um, and so that, there are a whole lot of people who see that, especially like, I don't want to just be like industrialist capitalists, <laughs> but you know, that that's kind of yeah. what it was who saw that as a threat and saw that as a, as a rising socialism, because mm -hmm. now instead of one individual going to their boss to ask for a raise, um, like that's the American idea, right? We are individuals and we're individualists. Right. Uh, you have collectivization of labor and collectivization is that big key word under socialism is everybody pooling mm -hmm. together for what you'd hope would be the greater good. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so there is this movement against that, um, this okay. uh, socialism and communism in the labor movement. And you start uh, to see characters rise up um, like Abraham. Um, I think his name is Veridi. It looks like Veride, but I haven't figured out the pronunciation yet. I'm still working <laughs> on those episodes. Okay. Um, you get guys like him um, who start prayer meetings. Um, with wealthy industrialists and members of city councils and governors, and eventually gets into um, members of uh, the Senate and the House and uh, Supreme Court leaders. And then you see the rise of um, the, the National Prayer Breakfast, uh, mm. which started as a, an organization or as a prayer meeting, a series of prayer meetings for mm. wealthy capitalists. Um, and then you see the, uh, the addition of um, under God into the Pledge of Allegiance um, hmm. in the 1950s. When, when did that happen? The I 50s. Was in, okay. in the 1950s, wow. yeah. Uh, wow. And that, a lot of this stuff kind of comes together in the Eisenhower administration because, uh, wow. you know, it's after World War II and people are feeling optimistic. And uh, there's been this whole ad campaign that's going to take me several episodes to cover, <laughs> mm. but to. Um, try to bond Christianity or try to tie religion, I should say, really Judeo-Christianity, -Christi uh, okay. Judeo-Christian ideas um, mm -hmm. to the United States um, and capitalism, which is okay. – so like com uh, the communist countries are going collectivist um, mm -hmm. and we in a reaction – or collectivist and secular, we in reaction went uh, um, capitalist and – religious. 
Okay. And so it was kind of a reaction to that. And you, there's a lot of, Interesting. Um, I don't want to say propaganda, but there's a yeah. lot of advertising oh. that goes out, even just straight up corporate memos that'll go out with that stuff. Um, really? That try to bond Christianity or really, really re religion um, to um, uh, patriotism in the United States. Huh. Um, so you start to see the rise of Christian America and yeah. those questions of, is the United States a Christian nation? Um, which is kind mm -hmm. of a, a gigantic question that hopefully I, I kind of open up in some of these episodes. Um, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people point back to the, the founding fathers and right. for, as that they were Christians. And it turns out that, uh, you know, there's this battle. Are they Christians or are they deists? Um, mm -hmm. And the, the reality is that the core eight founding fathers like Hamilton, Jefferson, Franklin, Washington, those guys, when they were writing those documents, uh, were actually um, something in between Christian and deists. So hmm. they deists believe that God set the world in motion and then walked away. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, these guys believe that God set the world in motion and stayed and stayed involved in the world. But they, he, he, um, that Jesus was not God, hmm. um, which is not Christianity and yeah, it's right. not deism. Um, hmm. So there's this sort of weird belief in God, but not a specific one, uh, sort of a general right. idea of God. And you see right. that in yeah. founding documents and you see that in one nation under God. Okay. Well, yeah. which one? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So so it sounds like this idea that the United States is a quote Christian nation is kind of a recent development over the last 70 or 80 years or so. Yeah, it depends. Or, yeah. I mean, you, you start to see it more publicly then uh okay. in, in the 40s and 50s. Um but there are still people earlier than that. Um Oh, what is her name? There's a there was a a, a female preacher in the 1800s. I think her name was Amy Semple Pearson. Am I right? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, she was also pushing for it then, okay. uh, for tying Christianity to a, a United States. So there have been traces okay. of it before that. Okay. Okay. Um, but um, uh, the reason I couldn't come up with her name is I haven't decided if I'm doing an episode on her yet. <laughs> oh okay, Amy Semple McPherson. I think she was like a Pentecostal. Um, she was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. She right. was. Yeah. Well, okay, so so why does it matter? Like, uh, why does yeah. it matter if we consider the U.S. a Christian nation or not? Right. Yeah. Well, that's that is an excellent question, uh -huh. and that's something I struggle with a lot um, mm -hmm. because if we tie the United States to Christianity, then the actions of the United States, whether they are awesome or they are maybe evil, mm -hmm. get tied back to Christianity, and they reflect back on us. Um, okay. so one of the examples I use and the episodes that are out now, when you guys are going to be listening to this, mm -hmm. um, the, the United States is technically an empire. Um, um you know, we, wow. That's yeah. A strong statement. It's a strong statement. <laughs> <laughs> say, say more about that. <laughs> we, well, we, we, you know, it is empire. Ooh, it's a, it's a tough yeah. word. It, you know, it's scary, but, uh, -huh. uh from basically our inception, we have been expanding into lands mm. that were not ours, you know, mm. uh, mm -hmm. taking over Native American lands, taking over Native Alaskan lands. Um, mm -hmm. this, the Mexican-American War, much of the Southwest, uh, the, any area now that is struggling with um, yeah. should we keep Mexican immigration out used to yeah. be part of Mexico. Um, oh, yeah. I which, live in San Diego. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and we have a. Uh, so and it's interesting uh, to think about for me that you know this was Mexico, um, right. and the U.S. at one point decided we want that bay because it would be the San Diego Bay strategic. where we now it's a, it's very strategic, and so we're just going to push the border just a few miles south of the bay is what we basically did. Right, and uh, that's imperial, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you know at some point we kind of got to the Pacific Ocean and said. You know, hey, I wonder what's beyond this. Yeah. Uh, and so we get into uh, sort of uh, America's lesser known war, uh, the Spanish-American War, 
um, mm -hmm. where the United States takes control over Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, the Philippines, um, Wake Island, American Samoa. Yeah. And uh, a lot, you know, a, a number of those we still have today as territories. And, yeah. you know, one of those grade school things you learn about the United States is that the reason, well, one of the reasons we broke away from Britain was because of taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. And what do you think Puerto Rico has right now? Right. You know, no representation. No represent <laughs> well, and they'll, they can have representation. Um, I can't remember which of the houses it's in, uh, which mm. of the parts of Congress, but they don't have voting rights. Um, oh, and then they can't vote for president. Um, right. So huh. we, we are doing to other people what we broke away from England for. Um, yeah. So that um, we are technically an empire. And so hmm. when you then, if you were in one of those uh, territory lands and you see yeah. what the United States is doing, and of course there's a lot of positives yeah. and negatives to being a territory. Yeah. Um, you could say if they are, if the United States, the mainland United States is a Christian nation, um, is Christianity about oppressing people like me? Hmm. You know, um, okay. you get into a lot of issues there. Uh, oppressing yeah. people like you, meaning like if I lived so. in Puerto Rico, I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. Um, you know, it, hmm. we we have to kind of put our our ourselves in the shoes of other uh, of other people yeah, and see like right. how do the actions of the United States affect people? And right. if we say we are a Christian nation, that is going to color what they think of the, yeah. of God. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, not to say that again. Empire is not always. There are upsides to empire. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, in an episode that's coming up, huh. I, uh, I devised a game of capture the flag um, where we have three different games and in, in different games uh, you have resources, you have military bases. There are all these different challenges. Some teams are bigger than others. And so we kind of simulate empires uh, and the desire to take over somebody else to get their mm. resources or mm -hmm. to plant military bases so we can spy on them. Mm. Um, and, uh, and we get into discussions of where are their upsides? Uh, you know, if somebody has a resource that we need to function as a society, um, it, yeah, you can do trade agreements and stuff, but wouldn't it be more secure if you just owned that place? Um, yeah. or if you wanted to put military installations there, you know, uh, the, the locals are not going to rise up if they're part of you uh, or so the theory goes. Um, right. Right. So, but yeah. will they ever totally feel like a part of you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Especially if you don't give right. them the full rights of a citizen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, so, well, this may be going in a different direction, but I Do think it. about the Roman empire and <laughs> the, uh, and Israel, right? Palestine. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, they uh, did not have the rights of citizens. And they always viewed the Romans as the oppressor and the right. enemy. And if it's true, I mean, I don't know what it's like. But, you know, no doubt early Native Americans viewed America as the oppressor and yeah. the enemy. And even in our in our uh, 20th century mythology, right? Indians yeah. were the bad guys and cowboys yeah. were the good guys, right? right. And we continued right. that idea that, well, we have to, you know, keep these uh, savages at bay because they will kill us uh, white Americans. Right. Um, anyway, uh, <sighs> So there's a lot there's a lot that going on there. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's <laughs> Probably, taking me a whole year yeah. to tell so, the story. Yeah. So I can't wait to hear more of what you have to say in your episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, but there's a lot. We'll be back after these messages. This episode is brought to you by No Small Endeavor, the acclaimed podcast from Great Feeling Studios and PRX. In each episode, host and award-winning theologian Lee C. Camp sits down with courageous and impassioned people like Hollywood legend Rob Reiner and civil rights hero Reverend James Lawson, talking about what it means to find true happiness and flourish in day-to-day -day life. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, why not check out the recent episode with award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tim Alberta on Christian nationalism's role in the Republican Party. Follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So I think it's important to distinguish between Christianity and what we think of as Christian America or a, a Christian nation. Right. Um, my question is, what does Christianity lose 
or how does it lose by assuming or embracing the idea that the U.S. is a Christian nation? Yeah, well, I mean, we lose. I, I did this interview two years ago with Stephen Mansfield, um, mm. where he he talked about this concept of prophetic distance. Um, so mm. when you look at the prophets, especially like the Old Testament, they even if they were part of the king's sort of circle of influence, um, mm-hmm. they had a distance and they would, uh, you know, Daniel wouldn't eat the food of the king, um, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so that they could then have the ability to talk to power without mm-hmm. being on the take, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, without being tied to that power. And unfortunately, yeah. I think that we, we as the church are losing our prophetic distance and our ability to yeah. really speak to power because yeah. we're so tied up in it and we have so yeah. much to quote, you know, to kind of gain by keeping our people in mm-hmm. power. Yeah. Um, and then we also lose in some ways our witness to the world, um, uh-huh. especially to uh, educated people, even in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I went to uh, the podcast movement conference uh, in 2019 in August and I, um, uh, because of the, you know, my show is a Christian show and the subject matter we cover or I cover, again, I refer to myself in the plural, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because of the the content I cover, I, I got to talk to people about God and, mm. and time and again, people would say, well, what about this political issue? Or what mm. about this thing with the United States? It was like, well, mm-hmm. we're not talking about the United States. We're talking about God, yeah. you know, we're talking about yeah. Jesus. And, and people really do see us as tied up with the United States. Um, and so yeah. I, even just to like share your faith in those kind of instances, sometimes yeah. it, you f- yeah. I feel like I have to back up the foreign policy of the United States before I can ever share the gospel, mm. uh, which is just like, well, how do, what, what is this mess yeah. we've gotten ourselves into, you know? <laughs> When you say share the gospel, meaning with other Americans or yeah, with even with other Americans, other- yeah, 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 even yeah. other Americans, um, because yeah. you know we see all these other things we get tied up in, especially um, not to you know I don't want to speak particularly positive or negative about about the Trump administration, but mm-hmm. you can see how they have they have gone to la- at length to lengths to try to yeah. tie yeah. Christianity to their administration, um, yeah, and so right. if somebody is opposed to the Trump administration. Um, mm-hmm. they are going to butt heads with Christianity. And I saw the yeah. same thing with the George yeah. W. Bush administration as well. Mm. Um, not as much with the Obama administration, but um, uh-huh. in, in the times when I would get in conversations with uh, people who are not of faith, um, yeah. under either of those two administrations, I, I kept bumping into having to justify the actions of the United States, yeah. which is yeah. not the gospel. You know, that's right. The United yeah. States isn't going to set people free eternally. That's um, right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I mean, in your from your perspective, just your opinion uh, based on your research and your own faith, like what do you think would be a healthy relationship between Christianity and the U.S. or any nation state yeah. <laughs> or any government, uh, you know, any kind of government? By the way, um, uh, just a side thought again, um, you know, we, uh, the w- Western culture was for 1500 years, uh, uh, this union between church and government, right? The Holy yeah. Roman Empire, which was not the Roman Empire, it was, it was Christianity, Christendom of the West. And there was no, I mean, it, what, what it took was reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin to protest, hence the word Protestant, right? The kinds of government religious practices that were being issued uh, and practiced during that time. And so anyway, like you, I, I can't remember if this was before or after we started recording, you, you know, there is a precedent <laughs> for, <laughs> for this. Yes. And in a way, uh, th- what we're experiencing now might almost be uh, the death throes, so to speak. That's maybe a strong word, but um, uh, the ending or the, the falling apart of this um connection between church and state and the last gasp of of some who are trying to hold on to no church and state together 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 right um anyway that that's 
Yeah, so, I don't know so, about that, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So that's 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 my opinion. I mean, or that's kind of a thought. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But I think uh, we are we are certainly in a post Christendom world, or moving into a post Christendom world where there is less connection between uh, religion and government. Although, right? But we see it. We see people holding on to that and maybe trying to s- emphasize it in ways that. Are not necessarily healthy. I think. Yeah. Um, what 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 would a healthy relationship do you think be between government and and religion or Christianity? Yeah, I don't I don't know that there's any really great one answer. Um, mm. I, I think we get into this a little bit in that Empire of the Game episode where we play capture the flag. Uh, uh-huh. But it is it is really difficult to be an American and to be a Christian at the same time um, mm. because we're called to do different things. We're called in the United States, or excuse me, we're called in the Christian faith to obey our leaders. Yeah. Uh, but in the United States, we're also called to elect our leaders. Yeah. Um, and so like we then get into wanting to, I, I think it's you know natural that we would want to elect people who fit whatever our needs or ideology are. Uh, yeah. But then that makes it really hard to obey the ones who are not of that, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, we're yeah, on the other yeah. side of the aisle. Um, yeah. So we just, we kind of get into sticky situations. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that there's one clear answer, honestly. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, the, yeah. The, the point, I think the, the more important thing for me is to try to encourage people to be aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially, especially what we're doing to non-believers um, mm. or people who are kind of on the line who either want to who are thinking about Christianity or people mm-hmm. who are Christians who are thinking, gosh, we're tied up in all this stuff. I just don't agree with. Is God even real? Um, yeah, I, I right. want to kind of reach out to them and be like, Hey, listen, let's talk about how we got here. Uh, and mm. let's, let's talk about if this is really Christianity. Yeah. Um, I think that's so important, you know, yeah. understanding the context that we're in, right? Cause there's always a, there, there's always a context. Nothing emerges always. out of nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, what I'm hearing you say, um, you can correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but um, sure. it's important for us to, to distinguish between um, Christianity, right? Faith in Jesus, life with Jesus, yeah. and being a conservative Republican evangelical or even a progressive right. liberal, um, you know, Christian or, or whatever, and assuming that you have to hold certain political um uh, ideas or, right. or uh, ideals, um, and that as though it's a litmus test for your faith, right? Yeah, that's yeah. I think where it starts to get really dangerous because Jesus was not a Republican, Jesus was not a Democrat, Jesus was right. not an American. I, <laughs> you well, know, I think it's fascinating if you read the Bible and and try to. I recommend this to anybody. I, when I when I <laughs> went to college, um, I realized I had read a bunch of the Bible in high school, but that I was always looking at it through a lens of my church, mm-hmm. which can be mm-hmm. very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I didn't know what it just straight up said. Yeah. So I was, I challenged myself to read it as if I'd never heard this stuff before. Mm. And that was a really big thing to do. Like one of the most important things I've ever done in my life, mm. uh, because it forced me to be like, Oh gosh, the Bible doesn't actually say anything about this. Mm -hmm. Or if you watch Jesus, it's, it almost seems like he's brushing off political statements, you know, like when they're like, well, should we pay taxes? It's like, whose pictures on the money? Yeah. Yeah. Give it to that guy. You know, like that he didn't tell us to rise up. Right. (laughs) You know, we have, I have an episode that's called is revolution biblical. Mm. And really it's, it's very hard to make the case that it is Wow, because Jesus didn't tell them to revolt. He told them to obey. And we're talking about the Roman empire, which was about to get really, really ugly. Uh, In in fact, under the writings of, of Paul and some of the other guys who wrote the new Testament, they, they were in in some of the worst of it. Um, And and they were still saying, you know, obey your leaders. Um, Don't, don't cause trouble where you don't need to. Um, And that's, that's really hard for us as Americans Mm because we, you know, if if uh, if somebody tells us to stay inside during a virus instead of going to our physical church, we get really right. bothered. You right, know? right. Um, it's yeah, we're uh, we're so used to that kind of 
liberty yeah. that we don't realize that that isn't actually a part of the actual Bible. Right. Um, right. And that, not that liberty is wrong. I am super thankful for liberty. Yeah. It's just not really in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not, not the way we tend to. Not the way we it. think of it. Yeah. 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 Spiritual liberty is all over the Bible. For but sure. But physical sure. liberty is not. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, yes and no, <laughs> my opinion. Yes and no. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Sure. I mean, Jesus yeah, yeah, yeah. did say he came to set the oppressed free. I think there is a case to be made, and uh, now we're really, uh, we'll wrap it up here in about two minutes. How about that? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> thinking. Dodge, get out of this. Uh, but, you know, yeah. I think there is a case to be made. Hey, when someone is uh, falsely imprisoned, right, part of what yeah. God wants for the world is justice. Uh, of part course. of the one. Yeah. When someone is imprisoned by poverty, one of the things that God wants for the world is provision and abundance. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean yeah, everyone has to be a millionaire, but hey, I have right. enough to live on and to be happy in life. I think God wants that for the world, right? And so, yeah. so I think in addition to eternal salvation, Jesus also came to make the world a better place, right? And to yeah, make the sure. world that he intended when it was the Garden of Eden, you know? Um, yeah. And and that's what we see at the end of Revelation. Now I'm getting all theological, sorry. Uh, that's great, go <laughs> right? for it. You know, I but, was going to say, yeah. Well, go ahead. But, but, but to get to that Garden of Eden, uh, sort of the mm-hmm. bookends of the Bible, um, there's, there's a whole lot of tribulation in between here and there. For sure. And, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and and I think it's one of those things that we, one of the reasons that so many American Christians struggle is that we refuse to talk about that mm. struggle being real and yeah. being biblical. Yes. Um, because we're so used to prosperity and God wants you to succeed and God is giving you a dream and a goal for yourself. Yeah. You know, God, God's whole purpose for you may that you be that you get fed to the lions. That's true. You know, God's whole purpose for you may be that you are you know you are a low income worker who just does the best with what they've got yeah um that that may be it but we we re- really get uncomfortable in the christian world telling people that right um and, and that's I, I think one of the reasons we're so insecure and and i don't yeah. want to uh, I want to clarify. I'm not saying prosperity gospel. <laughs> okay. Yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I appreciate that. Yeah, you're sure. right. Um, but there can be there can be joy and abundance and wholeness even in a low income job where you are fulfilling your calling to, you know, fix cars or whatever. And that may not be, yeah. a, you know, or even to sell gas at the grocery store so people can feed their families by going to work and coming home again. And, and you are a part of that, right? There is an economy of God at work, even in our human economies, where we provide for one another through the gifts that we have and the work that we do. And all of that adds to what I think of as the shalom of the world, right? Yeah. And um, and when we when we get locked into the idea, well, a Christian nation has to look like this or this or this, then we lose all kinds of possibility for what God maybe wants to do in the world. And it may be right. different than what we expect. <laughs> it may be. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. And interesting. Oh, yeah. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's, it's funny that we have kind of circled back to labor, mm, um, which mm-hmm. is how the whole thing kind mm, of started. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I think one of the, the main things I want to bring up in this season is uh how do we as workers and as employers stop stuff like this from happening? Yeah. Um, so like in, in, in the United States, we kind of went and, you know, tied ourselves to Christianity and capitalism, and that kind of stuff. But yeah. really, you know, the labor unions would have been completely useless. Uh, like they would never have sprouted up if people had just been treating their, their workers well. Yeah. Czar Nicholas yeah. would never have been yes. kicked out of office if the people would have been treating their people well. Yes. Good. Um, and uh, and that's that's something that is so easily missed yeah. in all the hubbub and the anger about communism right. and socialism. Right. There would be no need for that stuff yeah. if if we were just doing the right thing by our, our that's employees. Right. That's right. I, I think um, God wants yeah. good governments. I think God wants yeah. good systems and structures. But the way it really is going to happen is when when God changes human hearts, when, when our hearts turn towards yeah. the God of love and justice and healing and wholeness. Right. And when we right. treat people in our society, the way God does, the way Jesus did, right. Then everything's better. <laughs> right? It really works out better. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, all right. Let's, let's go ahead and stop there, man. This was great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me just ask you, how can uh, folks connect with you if they want to connect with you? And uh, yeah, yeah. 
where you can find the show Truce Podcast. That's T R U C E. Uh, just about anywhere you get podcasts or at trucepodcast.com. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at, at Truce Podcast. And uh, I'm, I laid down a little bit of a challenge that I really. I really would love to be able to double the audience by the end of the summer. Mm. Um, cool. Just because uh, I, it's a lot of work. This show takes yeah. uh, between like 15 and 40 hours per episode wow. uh, to produce. And the 15 ones are the rare exception. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if you could just tell a friend about the show, it would make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it is a great show. So I just I encourage Praise everybody God. to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we're asking a lot of big questions. Yeah, it's good. Well, thank you for doing the show and for all the work that you, you put into it. And thanks for being here today and uh, talking it's about this, pleasure. which I think is a really important uh, issue. Something we, yeah, we definitely need to be wrestling with. So thank you, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, this is some really fascinating stuff, isn't it? Uh, it felt like we were just beginning to scratch the surface of this topic and the questions that it raises as we were talking near here at, at the end of, of this uh, interview. And I have to be honest, I felt a little bit bummed out to have to bring the conversation to an end. Uh, but here's the good news. Uh, Chris, Chris Starin, as he mentioned, is spending a year on this topic uh, on his podcast, Truce. Uh, he has already spent several months exploring the rise of communism in Russia and how that began to affect people in the United States during the early and mid 20th century. And so if you want to dig further into this topic, I encourage you to check out Chris's podcast. Uh, I will include a link to it in the show notes uh, if you want to find it. Or you can also just search for Truce Podcast, T-R-U-C-E, uh, in whatever podcast app uh, you use. Uh, and then I'd also just want to encourage you uh, one last time to check out my newly minted Amazon bestseller, Beyond Thingification, Helping Your Church Engage in God's Mission. Uh, I'll include a link in the show notes, uh, both to the Amazon page where you can buy it, as well as to the book page on my website, which you can find at www.marcuswatson.com slash book. Well, thank you so much again for being here, and I will see you next time here on Spiritual Life and Leadership. And that was my interview on spiritual life and leadership. If you enjoyed that podcast, and I think you'll like a lot of the episodes on there, you can find spiritual life and leadership just about anywhere you get podcasts. You can also find details about it in your show notes right now. Remember, Truce is listener supported. If you'd like to support this show, please go to trucepodcast.com slash donate, and you may even be able to get some pretty awesome bonus material. We'll be back in two weeks with a normal, fully produced episode of the Truce Podcast. Please subscribe so you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Chris Sterren, and this is Truce.